Hey, good morning, crew. So good to be with you today. Glad you showed up. This would have been really lame without you, but uh, really excited for today, everybody. Hey, really quick, just want to let you know we are in open sign-up period for our home groups. If you are not in a home group, want to really encourage you to take advantage of the connection card that's on a chair around you. If you don't see one, you can go to our website, nscbellingham.com, under the signups page. We got bunch of home groups meeting all across the county. And uh, you know, whenever we talk about home groups, I like to say a couple of things. Number one, a lot of churches, they have home groups as a part of their ministry. For us here at New Song, really, this is where ministry is taking place. I want to tell you, you are not going to get everything that God wants to deposit in your life through your time spent here at this church, unless you are in a group uh, with other people, with other Jesus followers. So would love to see you connect there, friend. If you're not in a home group, we got people that have been praying for you, and it's going to be a great great home group season. Can I get an amen from somebody in church today? All right. It's going to be good, guys. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Mark chapter 14, everybody, is where we are for our study of God's word this morning. We're making a pivot from Mark 13 into 14. And uh, of course, the, the air around the end of Mark chapter 13 is leaving everybody with a sense of expectation and hope. As Jesus has made some incredible statements, he's like, hey, what's up, everybody? I'm going to come bla- back with the clouds of glory. I'm going to renew the creation. Everything's going to change. Everybody has high hope, high expectation. And of course, as we break into Mark chapter 14, that continues to be the tone as we see this in verse one. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Now stop right there for a second we got to understand uh, is that the city of Jerusalem around these feasts was buzzing, that people would come from all around the world to study, to celebrate rather Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We got Dr. Hubbard coming in a couple weeks, everybody to talk to us more about Old Testament fulfillment and Jesus around the feasts and Passover and Unleavened Bread. It's going to be a banger. You don't want to miss it. But just as by means of introduction, here's the big idea that throughout the Old Testament, God would command his people to remember what he had accomplished for them through the celebration of these annual feasts, sort of like a holiday. Now, this is where, in view of American holidays, we just get gypped, right? It's like for us, hey, kids, normally this is completely inappropriate and we call the cops, but Santa Claus is going to be wandering around the house tonight. Don't be afraid, right? It's jacked, right? Or the Easter Bunny's coming, you're going to go look for eggs because we don't know why, all right? And now for the Jews, God is like, all right, hey, y'all, remember that one time when you were slaves in Egypt and I, Moses got raised up and he opposed Pharaoh and I broke the most powerful man on the planet and then delivered you and there was plagues and you went to the Red Sea and it parted. You walked through and I drowned your enemies. Yeah, that was flipping awesome. We're going to celebrate that every year, right? That's awesome. That's the feast. And when you look at the feast of Passover and this this feast of unleavened bread, it's about, it's about the night before the context around the Jewish exodus from Egypt. So what had happened is you have God shows up and he's like, okay, I'm going to send plagues. Pharaoh, let my people go. He hardens his heart. God hardens his heart. Heart. Who really knows, right? For those of you that are hardcore, like predestinationists, here's the thing about God hardening Moses' heart. The question is, did he harden his heart or God did? 10 times it said God hardened his heart and 10 times it said Moses hardened his heart. So there is divine mystery. But nevertheless, the plagues are poured out on Egypt and God is delivering his people. It comes to this climax where God says this, okay, Pharaoh has resisted me thus far. Now this is gonna be the plague to end all plagues. I'm gonna send the angel of death and going to snatch every firstborn son from every family. However, if you, my people, will take a lamb, all right, this is the context of Passover, slaughter the lamb, take its blood, and put it around the doorpost to your house, the angel of death will show up and pass over your home and move on to the next one. And then your son will be spared. This is the idea of Passover. Now, when we get to the gospels, we see that it really is all about Jesus. We'll continue to see that in Mark chapter 14. John the Baptist makes this incredible declaration of Jesus. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? So the whole thing, guys, the feast of Passover is meant to point us to the person and the work of Jesus, where he would die as a substitute, be slaughtered for you so that those who are under his blood are now safe from death. Right? That's the gospel. That's the feast of Passover. Now, what's really interesting, I was reflecting on this, what God commanded the people to put on the doorpost was the blood of a substitutionary sacrifice. You know what he didn't say put there? Moral track record. 
right? You, you got you to put how awesome that you've been on the post of the door. You got to, you know, like, hey, here's your church attendance roster. Keep showing up here. I'm not saying go away, right? That would be really lame if you went away. And then it's just me. And then we're back to 2020 and I'm preaching to an empty room and it's a disaster and I don't want to do that. So keep showing up, but that's not on the doorpost, right? It's not moral track record. It's not doing good things. It's not, you have an Instagram bio with an out of context Bible verse. And so now God's going to pass over you with the angel of death. It's none of that. It's the blood of the lamb that's on the doorpost. Meaning this isn't about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. And of course, in the subsequent weeks, we're going to see how that is all about the person and the work of Jesus. Now, when we get to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is a uh, weekend long celebration where the people of God would eat bread that was unleavened because they needed to be ready to leave from Egypt at any moment. They didn't know when God was going to say, okay, now's the time, get up and leave. So they had to have bread that was unleavened. They didn't have time to let it rise because they need to be available to God's call to leave at any moment. There was urgency. There was immediacy to their deliverance. And friend, this is true for you and I as well as followers of Jesus. This is what it means, all right? Let me be very clear with you. It means that you're ready ready to move at any moment's time, right? It's a posture of listening and of obedience. This is what it means to be a Christian. We were looking at this fascinating verse last week in Ephesians chapter six, verse six. I want to pull this back up. This is so scandalous to the modern mind. This is your state. If you are here, you're a follower of Jesus. This is who you are. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. That's who you are. That's scandalous to the modern individualistic, I am king, sovereign ruler of my own life. I'm a slave to nobody. I belong to nobody. This is all about me. This is all about my will. When you become a follower of Jesus, that thing gets crucified and killed and laid in the tomb with Jesus. And no longer is it about you being led by your own will and your desire. It's you submit to his will, right? That's Christianity 101. This isn't about your your will, it's about Jesus's will. This isn't about your preferences anymore. This is about what does Jesus prefer? That's how you and I begin to think. This is what Paul says, right? And now this is critical because when we approach then the person, the work of Jesus, that means that he has authority over our lives. So he says, go, you go. He says, stay, you say. He says, do this, give here, don't give there. That's what you and I do because ultimately we don't belong to ourselves. Don't forsake the gathering, Hebrews chapter 10. So we're gonna show up, church is in pen, it's not in pencil. pencil. This is how you relate to the church, the people of God. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. This is how you relate to your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children as parents. That's what we're gonna do because it's not my will. It's Jesus's will. And now let me say this, friend. How many of you know, by the way, that that doesn't mean that it's always gonna be easy? And, and let me just take it a step further and just say, it doesn't mean that you're always gonna like it. Can I get an amen from somebody in church today, right? It doesn't mean you're gonna like it, right? We have this bad idea that says, okay, well, if it's God's will, it's gonna be easy. It's gonna just be awesome for me. And it's not gonna be difficult. And it's not gonna be uncomfortable. Dude, that's not how God works. In fact, if you look at Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, this is the context of his crucifixion and suffering. Father, if you are willing, all right? This is what Jesus says. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus is saying, hey God, you know, like I know we have had this plan since eternity past that I was gonna give up my life as a ransom sacrifice for fallen broken people, take the wrath of God, be crucified as the lamb of God, all of that. Uh, I really don't want to do that right now. That sounds horrible. This is what Jesus is saying. If you are willing, if there is another option, I'll take plan B. That's what Jesus is saying. I, I'll, I'll go that route. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. God is calling Jesus to do so. And of course, Jesus is crucified. He does go through with the difficult things. So friend, let me just save you some pain in life because here's my concern for a lot of people in the room. God never contradicts you and it's not because he's not trying. It's because you're not actually listening. That's the point, right? It's, it's it, it, like, it, does God contradict you? Do you have the kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit where you're getting convicted, where you're experiencing conviction? It's not the person that experiences the conviction of the spirit that I'm worried about. It's the person that doesn't. Right? It's not the person that gets contradicted by God and whoa there, dude, what are you doing? We're going to go this way and that has an internal struggle with the will of God. It's the one that doesn't even care that I'm concerned about. In fact, Zechariah, he says it this way, the prophet Zechariah. 
It's talking about the people of God, but they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. And for anyone to ask you a scary question in view of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and this whole idea of application that we're on, is that true for you? Have you stopped your ears? Is God asking you to do something, go somewhere, say something, get out of a relationship that's toxic and horrible that you're enmeshed in? Is he asking you to do something that is difficult and uncomfortable and and you don't want to, and so you've stopped your ears and you're not listening to his voice anymore? Let me be very clear. To be a follower of Jesus means, hey, uh, it's not that you're not going to struggle, by the way, all right? Jesus, he was talking to God about the struggle. I don't want to do this. This doesn't sound legit, doesn't sound enjoyable, doesn't sound fun. But nevertheless, not what I will. It's about what you will. Okay, so we've got Passover, we've got unleavened bread, we've got the city of Jerusalem buzzing, everybody's there. This is high hope, high expectation. This is where this takes a turn for the worst here, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the rest of verse one with me. It says this, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, for they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. All right, so you got the chief priests, you got the scribes. These are members of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling class, and they have made up their mind. They have decided to be resolute with this idea that Jesus is a religious and political rebel, and we actually need to take him out. We're going to kill him. And they're looking for an opportunity to do that. Now, of course, they're religious hypocrites and cowards, and so they're not going to do it during the feast because they don't want the people to rebel against them because the people thought that Jesus was a prophet. They're trying to figure out how to do this in secret. How do we take Jesus out in secret? And we don't know how Judas Iscariot would have figured out about this plan, uh, but he did. And, and by the way, it's like all the credit the Christian trendy moms like are always, I talk, I joke about this all the time because it's hilarious to me, trying to figure out what is the most trendy name to put on our kids, right? And, and it's like, let's just put like 20 random letters together and <laughs> that's the name, you know? And, and, but here's the thing, nobody has ever named their kid Judas. Have you noticed that? Why? Because that's the dude that betrayed Jesus. It's like, we got Simon, we got Peter, we got Andrew, right? We got Matthew, we got Mark all over the place. Nobody names their kid Judas. Why? Because he's the guy that betrayed Jesus. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says this, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is part of the scandal here, everybody, that Jesus was betrayed from within. Judas was one of Jesus's 12 original disciples. Judas was closer to Jesus than literally anybody in all of human history. I want you to think about how scandalous this is. And he's the guy that betrayed him. Now, here's the terror of what we just saw right there. It shows this, that proximity to Jesus does not mean Jack. You could be as close to Jesus as Judas and and, and yet miles away in your heart and in your soul. And it doesn't actually mean anything, right? And so this is where you and I need to be careful. Why go to church? Yeah, so did Judas, bro, right? I pray sometimes, so did Judas. Now I'm using my gifts to serve Jesus and to serve Jesus's people. So did Judas. He, he had some sort of financial ability. He was in charge of the financial stewardship of Jesus's ministry. And he was also a thief. So he was taking some of that money for himself, right? I, I believe in God. So did Judas. This is a part of the problem that proximity doesn't actually necessarily mean anything. He didn't make it guys. Why? It's because he didn't love Jesus. He didn't cherish Jesus. He didn't treasure the gospel. That's why, that's why he didn't make it. And this is where we say all the time here at New Song, like we want Jesus to be Lord and savior of your life. Absolutely. That is so necessary for you and I, but we also want him to be your treasure, right? Do you actually treasure him? Because your life is lived in the direction of what you value. That's why if, if you treasure Jesus, if you value Jesus, that means that your decisions are gonna be made in his direction. If he's what you treasure and what you truly value, your heart is gonna be free of idolatry and false worship of false gods and sacrificing at false altars. And you will be a person that's living into his desire and his will for your life because you treasure him. The scripture says, 
where the treasure is, that's the direction that the heart is going to lead you in life, right? What do you actually value? Judas did not have the kind of value that Jesus rightfully deserved. Now, what's really interesting about uh, this section of scripture, everybody, is theologians and scholars will talk about a literary device that Mark uses called a Mark and Sandwich. I wish there was a cooler name for it, but that's what they called it. So that's what we're going to stick with, all right? And, and so what Mark is doing is he has a story right out the front, and then there's a story down below with a contrasting story right in the middle. And what Mark is doing is he's preaching at us without actually adding any commentary. So here's what we have so far. We have the chief priests and the scribes seeking an opportunity to betray Jesus and kill him and arrest him by stealth. Then we have Judas ready to betray Jesus from within. And this is where the story stays shocking, all right? It's shocking that the religious elite are looking to kill Jesus. It's shocking that one of Jesus' disciples, and for those of you that have experienced betrayal, by the way, uh, this is where the gospel heals all hurts. Jesus was betrayed. We're going to see every single person walk out on Jesus in this moment. Have you ever been abandoned before? Have you ever experienced betrayal? Jesus has experienced that same pain and he can meet you there and bring healing to you there because he knows the sting of betrayal and abandonment. The shock is that Jesus is betrayed from within. Now, here's where this takes an interesting turn. We get to verse three. Look at this verse with me. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Okay, so several things going on here. We've got Simon the leper. The guy's identified as Simon the leper. This is a man who had leprosy that Jesus would have healed. How do we know that? Because nobody would be eating meals with a leper. So he has been healed by Jesus. And he, of course, out of his gratitude and thankfulness, Jesus, you did this amazing work in my life. Come into my home and I'm going to make you some food, right? It sounds like a good idea, all right? So Jesus heals him, brings him into his house, and now we have this unnamed, masked, we don't know anything about woman that shows up to this dinner gathering that she likely was not invited to. And in a moment of extravagant worship and devotion, she takes this thing that is incredibly precious to her, breaks it and pours the oil all out over Jesus. Now, let me talk to you about how this is so scandalous. Okay. Because you and I look at that and we're like, okay, yeah, I can kind of see that's, it's probably a big deal. I don't really know what's going on. All right. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. A few things. Number one, culturally, a woman is not allowed in this type of a setting. Men said, amen. Just kidding. You're smart. All right. Get a good decision. You almost just got shanked, dude. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. You might show up to church and just die. I don't know. But right they're, they're not, they weren't invited. That wasn't a part of the thing. It's like, this is boys night. We're chilling. We're hanging out. Women aren't allowed. If they were present in Jesus's context, uh, it was in the form of a servant girl. She would have been there to actually wait on the tables. But the fact that she was there and actually a participant in the meal, this is completely scandalous. She is breaking the rules to get to Jesus. That's what she's doing. She doesn't care about the cultural customs. She doesn't care about the opinions of other people. She's like, I'm going to get my appointment with Jesus and I don't care what anybody has to think about it. This is, this is what I need to do for him because of the value and the worth that I see in this man. Now, second thing that's going on here, it says that she had a pound of ointment. It's described as pure nard. It's very costly. It likely came from India and she broke the flask and she poured it over his head. So what you and I need to understand about this friend is we're going to see later in the text that it was worth about 300 denarii. That, if you do modern US dollar equivalent contrast, is the equivalent to about a one year's wage. So we're talking like $65,000 that this woman just showed up and just broke at the feet of Jesus. This is extravagant financial generosity. However, it's not just a moment of incredible financial generosity. She is also breaking her security and her hope for her future on Jesus's feet. All right. Now, what do I mean by that? Dr. Hubbard will point this out, talk about how that's likely uh, her dowry. 
So in Jesus's culture, women's ability to flourish in life was very much closely connected to their relationship with men. It was their relationship with their father that brought protection and security to them and stability. It was their relationship with their brothers. It was their relationship with their husbands. That's what made the difference for women in Jesus's culture. This was likely her dowry, y'all. This was probably a family heirloom. So there is sentimental value because women in Jesus's day couldn't come by that kind of money. And here she is with it. This is an act of incredible financial generosity. She is actually sacrificing her ability to potentially get married one day. I want you to think about this, okay? Her options, if she breaks, uses, or loses this thing, is she could be confined to a life of serving her brother Lazarus or give herself to prostitution to make enough money to get by. Those are her two options, right? How many of you with older brothers are like, that's a bad deal, right? I don't want, I don't want either of those. And that's her. She, but she's like, you know, I don't care. I don't care about any of this. She shows up, she breaks the flask, which means that it cannot be used for any other purpose than this moment of extravagant devotion to uh, Jesus. And, and by the way, this is where dudes, I think we have a really difficult time uh, with this. There's this incredible idea in the New Testament that we are, as the people of God, the bride of Christ, right? And for dudes, I saw this picture. I wish I had it with me. It's hilarious. It's the, the headline is basically what men think when they hear that they're the bride of Christ. And it's this like Jack dude from the seventies in a wedding dress, like posing. It's super awkward. We don't know what to do with it, but guys, this is the point. What she's doing is she's saying, Jesus is worth everything. Jesus is worth absolutely everything, right? She's, he's worth, he's worth my money. In fact, what was really interesting this last week, uh, I was in a coffee shop and I don't always spy on conversations, but I did on this one. And uh, there was this, this couple that was next to me. They were talking about how Christians are such hypocrites. It's always the thing. And I was like, hey, you know what? We got room for one more. Come and hang out on Sunday. We'll see a new song. And uh, amen. All right. And so uh, I heard this conversation of Christians are all a bunch of hypocrites. You know, it's like, look at the disaster in Florida with the hill, with the, you know, the hurricane, hurricane and, and where's the church and what are Christians doing? You know, if you believe this stuff, it's got to filter all the way down into your behavior. It's like, okay, lady, number one, let's talk about what your government is doing for the people in Florida. Uh, number two, what is the church doing? The same thing the church has always done. Tens of millions of dollars mobilized immediately to go to hurricane relief in Florida happening right now. That's under the surface, guys. You don't see it. Why? Because it's good news, but this, and, and it doesn't sell. It's not going to break headlines. You don't look at how generous the church is for 2000 years, loving the poor, caring about people that are marginalized and destitute whose homes are ruined. Way to go, Church of Jesus. Of course, that's not going to work. That doesn't fit the narrative. That doesn't fit the mold. You look at Franklin Graham, Samaritan's Purse, getting d d disaster relief buses down there right away. Countless dollars and volunteers and resources. We actually had a couple, uh, a family actually rather from New Song that just flew out this last week to go help out. What's the church doing? The same thing that the church has always been doing, right? Radical generosity and service of other people in need. To their point, much of the church is stingy. Some of y'all, all right? Now, this is interesting. Whenever we talk about this, he's not gonna talk about money, is he? Yes, I am, all right? Because the text is forcing me to take it up with him. You're not mad at me. You're mad at Jesus. All right. Now here's this. Some of y'all, you're so stingy. You don't give anything. You'd never give any money. And, and it's like, what, what do we do? What are we doing here? What she's saying is I, take every dollar, Jesus. I don't care. You are worth more than that to me. Right. And the reason why is because your idol is security. That's the idol. It's actually security. Money has your heart. Jesus doesn't actually have your heart. Because if you did, then it would be like, Jesus, you're the supreme value, right? Take whatever you want. It's all, it all, it's not my will, it's your will. This is radical sacrifice, hope for a future, giving up of security that she is breaking at the feet of Jesus saying, you are worth it all. Jesus, you're worth everything. Now, when you continue on with the narrative, look at verse four and five, it says this, there were some who said to themselves, indignantly, that's a really key word actually in the Greek. It's this idea of red hot incensed anger, right? Carries the idea of the flaring of the nostrils. They're not marginally upset. They are incensed and angry at Mary's extravagant devotion and worship here. And it says this, why was the ointment wasted like that? What are you doing? This is ridiculous. Mary, you're a joke. You just look at everything that you just gave up. 
You don't get that back, right? Your life is now on a completely different trajectory because of what you just did in this house and what you just gave Jesus. Everything just changed for you. What are you doing? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor and they scolded her. You wanna know who this is, by the way? This is Jesus' disciples. This is his original crew, guys, right? You wanna talk about church hurt? All right, imagine like the apostle Peter be like, you're an idiot, what are you doing, right? Like that's a good reason to have some church hurt. But here's what's really interesting. She didn't get offended. In fact, two out of three times that Mary shows up in the New Testament, she's being criticized by other people. And she didn't defend herself. She didn't defend herself. She didn't jump to her own age. She just continued to pour herself out at the feet of Jesus. So they're demeaning, they're rebuking her, but also I want you to see this. They're also demeaning and rebuking Jesus. You want to know what his disciples are saying? Jesus, surely you're not worth that. Surely you are not worth what just happened right here. And in fact, the poor are probably of more value than we could have sold that. Imagine all the good that we could have done in the world. You are not worth that. Surely Jesus, you understand that that's the case as well, right? This is what they're saying. They're not only demeaning her, they are also in fact demeaning and rebuking Jesus uh, and saying he's not worthy of the sacrifice. This outsider, nameless, faceless outsider woman who's breaking cultural customs in a moment of extravagant worship and devotion is saying, yes, he is his own crew. The insiders, no, he's not, right? No, he's not. And isn't this still the case today, friend, that religious people ruin absolutely everything, all right? This is what they continue to do. James Edwards, he says it this way, the world has never had a problem with religion and moderation. It has no problem with too much wealth, too much power, too much sex, or too much influence, but as a problem, it does have a problem with too much religion, That's the case still today. And here's what it sounds like. Let me give an example of this. There's so much to be said about this in modern church culture. Here's what it sounds like. It is a religious spirit that is coming from somebody whose heart is lukewarm and dead that is trying to sound spiritual and profound, saying something to the effect of, well, that's not wise. That's not wise. And there is a legitimate biblical category called wisdom. There's several books in the Bible all about wisdom. You got got Proverbs, you've got Ecclesiastes, you got several others, whole books of the Bible that are dedicated to this idea of wisdom. However, in the modern church today, we have a religious spirit cloaked in a false sense of wisdom. It's not wise to give 10% of your income to the kingdom of God. Imagine what you could do with that money. It is not wise to talk to your coworkers about Jesus. What are you doing? You could get fired, right? It's not wise to go to a nation that's hostile to Christianity as a gospel witness and care for the people there. You could get martyred. It's not wise to do these things for Jesus. Imagine what it could cost you. Here's what I love, guys. Look at Jesus's response in verse six to nine, all right? This is what he says. But Jesus said, let her alone. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. He's talking about how he's about to die and rise and ascend to heaven. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, look at this. This is profound. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So she doesn't defend herself. Jesus defends her. And this is what happens, friend, when you decide to roll your entire life into the lap of Jesus is he does the work of defending. She didn't get offended. She didn't defend. She trusted Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He came to her aid. This, by the way, this wasn't difficult for her. I just want to point this out. Uh, Sometimes this, like this is extravagant, radical worship. You probably are looking at this and like, dang, that's kind of wild what she did right there. And why this is so important, guys, is because we show up on Sunday mornings and people say really dumb stuff like, you know what? Worship just wasn't for me today. You know, it's like this good thing. It's not about you, bro. It's about Jesus, right? This isn't about you and I and, and well, my, that worship leader wasn't there or that one was or whatever. I didn't really like it. I didn't really resonate with it. It's not about you, dude. And Mary got that. And she's like, this is because here's the thing, guys. Some of you, I'm just gonna be honest because I love you. I'm your pastor, all right? And y'all look like the walking dead some Sundays during worship. It's just like, <clears throat> I'm ready. 
did get out of here. You know, like, I don't know what we're doing. Dude, do you understand the worth of Jesus? This isn't about you. This is about him, right? It's a classic. Every home group that I've been in for the last like 10 years, uh, this always comes up in every home group. It's the prayer request where you get somebody that's like, you know what? Yeah, I just really, I just really would love prayer for that. You know, I would just carve out time to hang out with Jesus and, and then I just get up in the morning and read my Bible and pray. And I'm kind of in a spiritual desert right now. And Mary is literally like, laughing at you. What are you saying, bro? Right? What are you, you're in a spiritual desert? Are you, you're looking at yourself. That's why. Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus. Stop being so focused on you and how awesome you are. Look at him and worship him. You want to know the great thing about worship, by the way, y'all? You don't need to feel it to get your song on. You don't need to be in a great season where everything is just easy and awesome for you to turn your praise on. You get to look at Jesus and say, you know what, God, my life sucks right now, but you're still good. And I'm going to sing to you in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to go through this season of brokenness and difficulty because I recognize this is the only moment in history for all of eternity where there's gonna be tension. I'm coming to you, you're gonna wipe away every tear and I'm gonna give you an offering of worship and sacrifice and praise because you are worthy in the midst of the difficulty of my life right now. You don't need to feel it. Come on, somebody, you awake today? Y'all, I don't know what just happened to me right there, okay? How was the vein, was it impressive? So many people get so, you don't talk about it, all right? Makes it worse. Anyways, you don't need to feel it. You don't need to feel like you can worship to worship. Mary is proving that to us. She care about what anybody said. You care about what they thought. She's okay with criticism. Jesus is worthy. Amen? This wasn't difficult for her. Wherever, and look at guys, look at, look at Jesus's commendation of her, right? Wherever the gospel is preached, she's going to be a part of that story. It's going to be told in memory of her, not Judas, not the 12. They didn't make it. This nameless and faceless outsider that doesn't care about fame, doesn't care about applause, has no interest in influence or culture, and I'm going to leverage my relationship with Jesus for personal gain and power and money, which is the tragic reality of many false prophet pulpits across this nation right now, seeking to exploit the people of God for personal gain, getting into conference circuit to put money in their pocket. It's tragic, and it is happening by the, right now. By the way, let me just say this. This is why I have have always been at least bivocational and if not at times trivocational because I will not leverage this platform for my own gain. This is about Jesus. He's worthy, right? This isn't about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. She's the one that gets the commendation. We don't even know her name, guys. This is where I think that Jesus is uh, the ministry that's most near and dear to his heart here at New Song. We have a group of amazing moms that get together uh, during the week for a prayer time. They show up, they bring all their crazy kids with them and they worship and they pray together. And it's like, they got their kids running all over this room and like, you stop hitting him and put your pants back on. And you know, then you go right back into like, oh Jesus, you're so good. You got to work. You're doing an amazing thing, right? I always tell them, look, it, you, you women, you are the reason that revival is going to happen when it comes, it's your fault. It's literally that mom's prayer time. It, it, you don't know who they are. And there's not that many. And here they are, they keep showing up. They're not looking for a name. They're not looking for a platform. They just love Jesus and want to see him known in the church and in this city. And they're willing to give themselves and deal with the freaking pants down of child and like the head butting and boxing matches and, you know, like ripping the panels off of the wall. They're willing to deal with that because they so love Jesus, right? That's what it looks like, guys. Why? Why? Why do they do this? Why do countless incredible people here at New Song give so much time and resources and energy and money and give up their mornings during the week to come and pray and in the evening on a weeknight to gather with Jesus' people in a home group? Why do so many people show up here on Sunday morning to sing, to worship, to study the scriptures together? It's because the cry of the people of God throughout all generations has been, he is worthy. That's why we're here. It's because Jesus is worthy. In fact, if you look at Revelation chapter four and five, uh, chapter four in particular, there's this amazing moment where you get this 
insider's view to what's happening around the throne of God right now. Uh, This is where you can have a lot of peace and a lot of hope right now in an election year, by the way, everybody, because there is a throne standing in heaven. Amen. And there is one seated on it right now. He is sovereign over the nations of the earth and his name is Jesus. And this is an insider's look into what's happening around the throne room reality of God right now. This throne room is going to come to the earth and renew the creation, right? And this is what it looks like, okay? When you get around God's presence, this is what it looks like. Starting in verse uh, 10. The 20, actually, we're going to back up to verse nine. This isn't in the note, in the notes. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. Nobody's coercing them to do that. Nobody's like, Hey, if you could just lift up your hand for like 2.4 seconds, that would be great. You know, it's not like a, it's not like a bad midnight talk show where you have the dude that comes out with the card that says applause, you know, silence. And they're not doing that. What's happening for these elders is they are beholding the glory of Jesus Christ. And it is a knee jerk reaction to throw their crowns at his feet because he's worthy. Nobody's telling them to do that. They're just like, oh God, you're incredible. Bam, take it, right? Whole life, it's given to you. Now, what's the symbol of the crown? The crown is the symbol of the kingdom. This is the place. This is your accomplishments. This is your financial portfolio. This is everything that you've done in life. This is your kingdom over which you are sovereign. It's your values. It's the things that you have worked so hard to possess and to belong to you. And what's happening is they're beholding the glory and the worth of Jesus Christ seated on on the throne of heaven and it's transforming them and changing them. And it is their knee jerk guttural response to take the crown and to throw it at his feet. Why? Because they're realizing you're better than everything. You're, you're better than, I can't even believe I get to be in the room right now. Take it all. Just let me, if I could just be in the words of David, a guard at the doorpost of the temple, that's all I want to do. I just want to be close to Jesus. That's what they're saying, right? Is that, can you, is that true of your soul? Here's the reason. I'm not trying to beat you up. What I'm saying is if not, it's because you don't see him right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to hit this throughout the rest of the message because this is so important. This is not about you, you know, trying to be, oh, I got to love God more. I got to try really hard. I got to, I got to just, I got to double down and just fake it till I make, no, no, no. That's not what this is. You look at him. You encounter him. You see him and everything begins to change. Amen. Do you agree? This is the, uh, there's a, a, a hymn, there's incredible lyrics. You can have all the world, just give me Jesus. Because when you see Jesus, as he will be continually displayed in Mark chapter 14 and 15 and 16, when you see the worth of him, how incredible, how kind, when you encounter the gospel in a way that is accurate with what it came to do in your life, it is the easiest thing to lay it down because you see him as the true and the greater good. And so friend, if this is you, if your soul is weary from the criticism of religious losers, I just want to say this to you. Let them look, let them wonder, let them criticize you. Get on with it. Let your life continue to offend their cold, dead, loveless, passionless, lukewarm hearts. God might warm theirs yet. Let them look. That's what she did. Now, Make no mistake. I want to make just a couple more comments here. We're going to take communion. It's going to be awesome. There are both Judas and Mary in the room today. We have both. We have those who are ready to betray Jesus for their idols of security, money, fame, pleasure, and hedonism, sexual morality. Those ready to say, not God's will, but my will. In fact, C.S. Lewis is, he's quipped uh, this way. He said it, that there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those to whom say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says to them, thy will be done. 
And, and, and Judas is the one who's saying, this is my will. I'm going to do what I want to do. This is my idol of security and money and possessions and, and growing my own financial kingdom, right? I'm going to go after that. And, and I don't care about this Jesus stuff. That didn't really seem to work out for me. I'm going this way. We have Judas in the room. And we also have those who are saying, I just want Jesus. I don't, I don't care. I, I just want him. I just want to be with him. I don't need a platform, a name. I don't care what people think. Just give me Jesus. And, and nothing really else matters to me. Uh, I just want to be with him and close to where he is. And the outcomes, by the way, of both those characters are stark. If you look at the rest of the story, what's interesting, both of them are remembered, right? Both are remembered. Jesus says, wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done will be told in memory of her, but also what Judas did is told in memory of him. Like he made it. And part of the fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy right there is we're talking about this today. That's how you know he's faithful to his word. We're experiencing, you just experienced prophecy, by the way. Jesus is saying, as this story goes out, she's gonna be remembered. But we also remember Judas. Judas for his betrayal, his cowardice, his idolatry, his failure, his abandonment, and Mary as a model of true discipleship. The Puritans, they have this, uh, they had this saying that says, it goes like this, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. Worship team, community team, why don't you guys go to come on up and get prepped. And what they mean by that is that just as the sun will harden clay and it'll melt ice, it makes hard some things and it softens some things. This is what happens when you and I encounter the gospel, that it doesn't leave you the same. It actually forces transformation and change. Some of you, right, this is the tragic reality of what happens in these environments. Your heart actually trends towards getting harder. You don't stay the same. And then for others, it trends towards a greater position of receptivity, of, so of softness, and an ability to say, Jesus, just give me you, and I don't really care about anything. Judas had a hard heart, and he proved that proximity wasn't everything. Familiarity wasn't everything. Mary had a soft heart. Why? How? Can I tell you the secret of the whole story? You can lean in with me for a second. I want to tell you, I want to tell you the difference. The secret to the text is that she understood the gospel and Judas didn't. That's it. She understood something that Jesus didn't get. In fact, this is how John puts it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Look at this. We love because he first loved us. Friend, I don't want you to be thinking right now, I gotta, man, I gotta try harder. I gotta do more. I gotta work harder. I don't love God. My heart is lukewarm and apathetic. And bah, I gotta try. Brr. That's not what's at all what's going on here. It, this is, this is, John. no, this isn't how this works. It's not you stir up love for God. You wanna know what makes the difference? It's revelation. It's about receiving. It's not about doing. And in fact, what happens, we, there's this one moment where uh, one of the other narrative appearances of Mary is uh, where she is gathered. She's having a meal with Jesus and she's got her sister Martha and Lazarus, who Jesus just raised from the dead, epic story around her. Martha is busy in the kitchen. She's like, I got God in my house. Uh, we're gonna like make a good meal and it's gonna be awesome. How many Marthas we have in church today? All right, show of hands. A couple of you, God bless you. We need you. Martha gets a ra bad rap, amen, all right? We don't go anywhere without Martha. But here's the thing. She goes, some of you, you are a Martha and you got so much shame about it that you kept your hand down. All right, we're gonna get you delivered from that for just a second. She comes out and she talks to Jesus and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's not doing anything. And of course that's scandalous. She shouldn't be sitting alongside of men listening to this rabbi. Jesus doesn't care. Let her, let her listen, let her stay, let her sit here. This is what it's all about. Martha comes out and this proves that they were dysfunctional adult siblings, like maybe you are with yours. And she tattles to God about her sister. And she says, Jesus, Mary's just sitting at your feet. This is a joke. What's going on? Tell her to get up and come help me in the kitchen. She needs to do stuff. And I love Jesus's response. And so many of y'all, you need to hear this today. What does he say? Martha, Martha. Whenever Jesus says your name two times, you know what's going down. All right, Martha, Martha. What you, you're anxious and you're troubled about so much stuff. Your mind is just spinning. You're so concerned about, you know, I gotta take the bread out this morning. You gotta get the table placemats. Everything's gotta be perfect and it's gotta look great. It's gotta be awesome. And Jesus says essentially to Martha, you're missing, you have God in your house right now. Why don't you just come sit down? Let's have a conversation. And then he points to Mary again and he says, Mary, 
has chosen the good portion and it won't be taken from her. What, what's the contrast? She's sitting and not doing anything. Mary is not adding any value to that gathering whatsoever. She's just sitting, looking, gazing, and receiving from Jesus. Last line Jesus has in there, Mary chose the good portion and it's not gonna be taken from her. In other words, Jesus, again, is going to her defense. Got somebody criticizing her own family and Jesus rushes to her aid in her defense. It's not gonna be taken from her. This is what it looks like, y'all. This is what it means. It's about sitting and looking and watching and gazing and receiving, overdoing and trying hard and religious treadmilling. And I know this, we have people in the room right now, your relationship with God as a Christian has been so frustrated. You look at people around you and you're like, man, I, why, why can't I just be like, why is this so difficult for me? Why am I still where I was so long ago? Why don't I get it? Why can't I just get this into my head? And you try harder and you try harder. And the reason why you haven't experienced transformation is because you're doing the exactly wrong thing. This isn't about you doing anything. This is about letting Jesus love you. John 15, I, dude, I could just go, maybe I, we're just gonna lock the doors and not let you out because you gotta get this. What does Jesus say in John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches. You can't bear fruit without me, right? You take a branch off of a vine, it dies. It doesn't bear fruit anymore because the life isn't in the branch, it's in the vine. Jesus is like, I'm the vine, you're the branch. As long as you're connected to me, right? You're not trying hard. You've never seen a fruit tree that's like, you know, like super constipated trying to push out an apple. It just happens, right? Raspberry Ridge, love the golf course. You got these apple trees that are beautiful and it's just freaking apples all over the place. The branches aren't stressed out. They're not trying to produce everything. They're connected to the vine, the life of the tree, and they bear fruit every single year. Jesus is saying, this is what it looks like. It's not about you trying hard. Stop focusing on what, and some of you, you just need to get broken free from a religious spirit. I wanna give you permission to stop looking at the fruit of your life for a minute and look to Jesus. Because when you do that, when you stay close and connected to him, you receive the love of God in such a way that brings transformation. And then you begin to bear fruit. You can't make the fruit come. You can't make the transformation come. Jesus is saying, this is how you get there. You receive. We love because he first loved us. This isn't about you stirring up love for God. This is about God loves you so much that he took up your humanity, lived the perfect life that you could not live, died your death on a cross as a substitutionary sacrifice, satisfied the wrath of God proving that God is both loving and just as he deals with sin and he provides a means for you to not pay the penalty and you get on somebody else's ticket, namely Jesus. He beats death, rises from death three days later, ascends to heaven where he is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father right now. So you, by faith and repentance in him, can experience forgiveness of sin and security of eternal life. You get relationship with God right now. Look at the greatness of the love of Jesus for you. You want to see Christianity work in your life. Stop trying so hard. In fact, that's the beauty of the communion table is what communion does is it forces us back to the cross. It says, this isn't about you. This isn't about your love for God. This is about God's great love for you. This is about his body torn, his blood shed. You don't deserve it. You could never earn it. And yet look at the extravagance of the love that God, who is your father, has for you. Final thought, would you stand with me here? What's really interesting, and I think another reason why this doesn't land on people's hearts, it's actually because of pride. Now, I know that might sound really interesting uh, because it seems like a noble, right thing to say, I'm not worthy of God's love. And, and that's not true for me, it might be true for you, not true for me. Here's what you're saying. You're saying you're right and God's wrong, by the way. That's the scandal of that, which is incredibly proud. And you're saying that you're more God than God is. So here's what we're gonna do, everybody. The, the communion table, this has been called, depending on your church, tribe, tradition, background, it's been called the Eucharist, which is feast of celebration. And some of y'all, we'll talk about this in the coming weeks as we look at the history of communion. We have this idea that it's like a memorial. It's like, 
like the baby over here. You know, it's just like, shut up, dude, get off the stage. I want to go home, right? This is horrible. Get the pictures of Jesus up on the platform and let's mourn that Jesus is dead and feel really bad about ourselves. That's not at all how the church has taken communion the last 2000 years. It's about a feast of celebration, thanksgiving, and joy. Why? Because we're coming back to this great reality, friend, that Jesus has loved us and he provided a means for us to experience this great love before you ever drew your first breath. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us to that end. Father, I pray right now that you would come and hijack this space, that you would transcend mere words and that you would get all the way deep into our souls and the affections of our hearts and that you would do what you love to do and pour out the love of the Father in our hearts that would lead to our transformation as we realize this isn't about us earning favor and merit and approval with you, but you freely giving yourself to us. God, I thank you that this is not Mary confronts us and she convicts us not to try harder, but to actually step into a posture of humility and reception to say, man, this is true for me. God loves me. He's for me. He's not against me. His body was broken for me. His blood was shed for me. And God, I pray that that great reality and truth would hit the hearts of your people in this room in such a way that it would lead to true transformation and joy. In Jesus' good name, everybody said amen and amen. All right, y'all, we got three